Good evening. I'm Barry Bergdahl, and it is a pleasure to welcome you to MoMA. On behalf of both uh, my co-curators, I should say all three of my co-curators for, uh, for the exhibition, which is the occasion of this two-part symposium, Carlos Eduardo Comas, Jorge Francisco Lierner, and Patricio Del Real, who are all in the audience. We're taking a back seat now that we have delivered you a documentary excess upstairs. But also, I wanted to welcome you on behalf of our colleagues from the Princeton Mellon Initiative in Architecture, Urbanism, and Humanities. We are most grateful to them and to the Mellon Foundation that has made this uh, two-part symposium possible. And before I try to give just a momentary explanation of the articulation between the exhibition and the symposium, I wanted to ask Stan Allen if he would also say a word of welcome. Sure. Thank you, Barry. Um, and uh, I want to recognize uh, my um, two co-directors for the uh, Princeton Mellon Initiative, uh, Alison Eisenberg and Bruno Cavallo. Um, and add my, my thanks as well to, uh, to the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation for their generous support of the three-year uh, Princeton Mellon Initiative on Architecture, Urbanism, and the Humanities. Um, in particular, Marriott Westerman and Hilary Ballin uh, it's been our privilege to be able to work with them on this initiative. Um, at Princeton and on the side of the Mellon, um, Fabrizio Galanti and Bruno Cavallo have really been instrumental in putting uh, this particular two-day event, um, as I think everyone is aware, and we certainly invite everybody down to uh, Princeton tomorrow for an all-day conference that will kind of extend uh, some of the themes of the uh, exhibition. Uh, and then finally, uh, I want to say that, that from the moment that we decided that the focus of the Princeton Mellon Initiative would be on cities of North and South America, the possibility of a collaboration with, uh, with Barry, with MoMA, and this upcoming exhibition um, was, was really a kind of obvious one uh, for us. It seems to me uh, almost impossible to talk about the architecture of this period in Latin America without putting it in an urban context, without putting it in a larger political, economic, and developmental uh, context. And uh, that's in part what the conference uh, tomorrow sets out to do. Um, and it's been a great pleasure uh, to work uh, on the conference with Barry and with uh, Patricio. Um, it's been a very productive collaboration, and I want to extend my thanks to Barry and Patricio and to the MoMA for uh, hosting tonight. So. I won't take up any more time because I'm looking forward to the conference uh, today. So back to Barry. Thanks, Dan. Thank you. I won't repeat all the names you've just heard, but equally, uh, it's been a very wonderful conversation. Uh, the only difference between the symposium and the exhibition is it involved making even more difficult choices. But we have a wonderful uh, group of people that have come out of our discussion and responded to our invitation. I hope by now most of you have had a chance to view the exhibition up on the sixth floor of the museum. It covers a quarter of a century in more than a dozen Latin American countries. Perhaps the most frequently asked question about the exhibition has been why the years 1955 to 1980? And in many ways that is both, the, the, the answer to both of those dates is the topic of this two-part symposium. 1955 to 1980, a highly complex period in the history of the nearly uh, nearly every country in the ex featured in the exhibition represents not a period, not a stylistic period in the time-honored tradition of MoMA that can be looked at through the lens of a movement or a stylistic unity in architecture, rather a celebration of a period of diversity, experimentation, and most importantly, I think, contested viewpoints. If one single issue undergirds every design practice featured, it is the philosophy of ideology, uh, or ideology even, of developmentalism, whether in optimistic embrace or skeptical critique, whether in the progressive moment of Belo Unde's first presidency in Peru, for example, the difficult transition to military dictatorship in post-Kubitschek Brazil, or the project of Fidel Castro's revolution in Cuba. 1955 was the date of the last MoMA survey of the region. In a much noticed and influential exhibition, Latin American architecture since 1945, curated by Henry Russell Hitchcock, an alumna an alumnus of the international style enterprise of 13 years earlier. 
It was also a moment in the heyday of development, of the creation uh, of the discourses of developmentalism, of state modernization, of international aid programs based on development, of the creation of such institutions as the United Nations Commission for Latin America, CEPAL, or the US Alliance for Progress, or the Soviet exportation of prefabrication techniques, notably to Cuba and Chile. 1980 represents for us a moment, <coughs> excuse me, a, a, a moment at the onset of the systematic critique of many of those assumptions, be it in political and economic policies with the rise of the neoliberal critique of developmentalism, and even the dismantling of some of its instruments. It is also the moment when postmodernism launched a full-scale critique of many of the assumptions and credos of modernism. What can it mean to look back at this period today? That is the purpose of this symposium, first here at MoMA, with some of the most engaged and engaging practitioners from the region at work today, each of whom has work that resonates with some of the issues raised in the, in the period, but each of whom uh, are working today in vastly different circumstances, urban, political, economic, arguably professional, uh, that characterize the place of architecture in 2015 in the world in general, and what is again being elevated to a figure of discourse and debate, the Latin American city. Tomorrow's program at Pr the Princeton School of Architecture brings together a, large, uh, a larger group, primarily historians and critics, who have worked intensively on aspects of the period which were vital then, and I think as Stan implied, are of the moment again. The campus as an urban laboratory, the role of the imaginary of the city, the figure of the city, as I just suggested, and perhaps most urgent of all, the issue of the informal city and its status. Anyone who has spent time with the long yellow wall upstairs, which we call 25 years of housing, knows that that issue was discussed in text, films, and most importantly, in architectural design already a half century ago. Many have asked why a historic show, rather than a showcase for the impressive array of practices in Mexico, the Caribbean, Central, and South America today, practices that deserve to be better known outside of the region. Indeed, during the past seven years, we have, I'm speaking of the, uh, we, the group of four curators, have seen very impressive, even inspiring work at nearly every port of call, from Santiago in Chile to Lima, San Paulo, Medellin, and Bogota, to Mexico City, to name but a few of the centers of fervent architectural discussion and creativity today. We could have commemorated the 60th anniversary of Hitchcock's show with another one of those decade portraits that was the stock and trade of early MoMA architecture shows. But our aim was to excavate a period that has almost been obscured from view since after 1955, MoMA had only a very episodic and always monographic attention to Latin America. A beautiful show on Bergan curated by Emilio Ambas, a small show on Roberta Burli Marx. You will see as you go through the show as well that many key pieces have been acquired for the collection of the museum so that this period can continue to be interpreted and displayed not only by us but by others, not only in a regional dialogue but in an international one. This we hope as a building block in an engagement as well with contemporary practices uh, in the region. In this regard, as well, I should emphasize that we are especially proud to have been associated now for the last six years in, the, in our network of Young Architects programs with Young Architects Program Chile in Santiago, which has exposed us to the robust architectural culture of contemporary Chile, notably. Tonight, we have architects with us from Mexico, Brazil, and Colombia. I am not going to introduce them at length, as there are program notes on the back of your uh, brochure on each of them. I always feel as though sort of at a church assembly and you have your hymnal and on the back of your hymnal there are an introduction uh, to um, what we're all going to look at together. So introductions to Tatiana Bilbao, uh, Angelo Bucci, and Felipe Mese. Um, and moreover, uh, Fabrizio Galanti, who um, Stan just mentioned and who's been involved in the Mellon Initiative at uh, Princeton, an architectural historian in his own right, will serve as moderator and I hope build some bridges between the themes of the period uh, and the architectural work of these three practices today. Suffice it to say that we got in touch with each of these practitioners because it seemed to the organizers of the symposium, myself, Stan, Bruno, Fabrizio, that the themes of the period and the concerns and commitments of tonight's speakers uh, uh, resonated with one another. Angelo Bucci, one of the most pertinent voices in Brazil today, will speak first. 
As you can see from the program notes, he began his practice just as democracy returned to Brazil after two decades of the military dictatorship and has been involved in both residential and institutional building that established early a new voice, but with, it seems to me, a strong sense of the Paulista tradition. He will be followed by Tatiana Bilbao from Mexico City. She has a rich portfolio of work, but most particularly it is her work on inexpensive housing in the poorest regions of Mexico, which I thought a compelling contribution to the current debate on engaging again with one of the greatest challenges of the contemporary city, the housing issue, and in uh, incremental and assisted ways, in, uh, in ways that do not simply comply, and this I think is what is compelling, to the market models that have emerged ever so strongly everywhere and in Latin America in addition in recent years. Felipe Mesa is a key figure in the renaissance of architectural culture and civic reinvention centered in Colombia's second city, Medellin. He might dispute the second city. Uh, beginning with the work his firm, uh, Plan B, contributed to the exquisite botanical gardens there and continued with very important work in new school building uh, in Colombia. The assignment, I want to remind both our participants in this game show and the audience, the assignment to each and the basis for our discussion afterwards was a simple question. Please think about and respond to three or four things you have learned from the heritage of modernism in the period in consideration in Brazil, Mexico, Colombia, and or Latin America in general. Sometimes lessons involve emulation, sometimes they involve critical reflection, and sometimes they involve active resistance. I am eager to hear their thoughts on the question, as eager as I am to learn more about their work and the philosophy of their architectural commitments that we have all been following for the last few years. So I'm not going to introduce each one in particular, i just ask you to come up in sequence and then we're going to join uh, Fabrizio uh, in the red chairs. So we'll start with Angelo Bucci, please join me in welcoming Angelo to MoMA. Well, good evening. Uh, I, well, I will start by learning uh, how to manage this system. Okay. And, and then to, <clears throat> of course, to thanks uh, Barry, Patricio, Comas, and Leonor uh, for this amazing exhibition. Of course, that there is, I mean, it's very a privilege to be here to, to see the exhibition. Uh, thanks to give voice for that in production of architecture. And also to put then in, 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 a, in a condition to, to listen, you know, to, to be criticized. So I think this is the, the possibility to talk is very important for us all the time. Thank you also for Sarah Kennedy for all the arrangements to Fabricio uh, Galante, Bruno Carvalho, Stan Allen. Uh, so I'm very glad to be here. Uh, <clears throat> I, well, I would start by showing uh, one of the buildings that is featured on the exhibition. It, this is the School of Architecture of the University of Sao Paulo. I would say is the, the school where I, I I went to study architecture in A3. So the, the, the exhibition uh, comprehended the period, the period of time from 55 to 80. Uh, and my generation uh, started to study architecture like right after. No, A3, I, I went to this, this building to start my uh, architecture school. So it is a building uh, which play a very important role to the whole universe in the 70s, mostly that it is a, uh, let's say, a trick time in Brazil, but in the whole South America. And so I, 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 I would say, or the way that I feel, no, to like to give a kind of testify is, uh, of course, that what is shown that uh, this exhibition is a uh, <clears throat> is what we in, uh, I mean the inheritance of my generation. I think that is a legacy that we inherit in two different fields. So one field 
is what is showed in the exhibition. That is our tools. So it's uh, everything that we knew or that you produce as architecture or as modern architecture, but uh, in a Brazilian perspective, is the whole architecture that uh, in, uh, we could say we have uh, to face the future. So, and, and we inherit this in the first field at that time, at the 80s, as a tool. But we, and this is a very uh, rich, a very, uh, like uh, a privilege or a treasure to inherit that, all those works as a, a starting point. But in other hand, or in another field, we, we inherit from that same period uh, a kind of devastation because it runs at the same time in the whole South America and from my perspective in Brazil, we were under a dictatorship under the most, time, most part of the time feature in this exhibition. So, and, and, uh, and, and then in one hand, we inherit the tools, in other hand, we inherit a kind of uh, devastation in cultural terms. So we, we inherit the two, but we inherit a crisis that we, the, uh, we didn't know exactly what to do with everything that we inherit. So, uh, and this is a kind of uh, a challenge points to my generation. Oh, I like to show those previous pictures, uh, the, the building full of people, uh, to say a quotation by Villanova Artigas, the architect that designed that architecture school. He liked to say to the students, uh, we should learn how to design a building as a city and a city as a building or a city as a house. And, I, and this is my city. I, I, I would say uh, both pictures to, to show what I, I think is two institutions and both of them a part of my educational process. I mean the School of Architecture itself and the city of Sao Paulo as a laboratory. So, and what we inherit, you know, I mean, by the metropolitan condition, it's a 20 million people series, something that we, we learn a, a lot by being there. <clears throat> so, and, and, and the, what I, I think that we, I, I found on my generation is uh, as a challenge and stuff, is how to start again, how to build a platform uh, where the culture that we inherit could make sense one more time. So, <clears throat> as, as Barry said very precisely, uh, when I started school, uh, the Brazilian context was being an, an, not, uh, the, the democracy came back in, in 85, so it was 21 years old that last the dictatorship. But the, the fact that it's going to, uh, that we could recover the democracy time, uh, it doesn't mean that we knew exactly what to do, how to do, and, and what to do. So this is uh, a first project. I, 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 I thought about to show you three projects, like to give, a, give you some background to talk about how the previous production impact in our way to think on architecture. You know? And this is, is an important one to me because it made me think about how to deal with the, that precedent. You know? This is the Ibirapuera Park, is a project that is very well uh, shown on the exhibition, designed by Oscar Niemeyer and Burle Marx. Uh, underneath this point, <coughs> We have the canopy, uh, this huge slab that cover a, a, a important uh, part of the park we are going to see. And underneath this point exactly, we have a small museum uh, that is uh, the modern art museum of Sao Paulo. 
of that is placed underneath this marquee. And, <clears throat> well, two years ago, we, we had an invitation for a creator of an art exhibition that would be take place in this museum uh, for take part in an art exhibition. No, but he brought to the architects, he invited several artists, but also a group of a few architects. No, I wouldn't uh, took part in this exhibition if not by the enthusiasm of Juliana Braga, who is here, no, who, who uh, told me that we should, and I, uh, I, uh, we follow that feeling. So, but it, he brought us a question. How should do the modern art museum in the future? Because that situation underneath the canopy, it, it was a provisory situation that started in 69, but is in there even nowadays. So, and that was a question. If the museum should go back to center of Sao Paulo as it had a start before, or if it should remain inside the park, or, and we start to think that we could consider uh, a kind of relationship uh, with the, the park itself. No, this is uh, the, the, the idea, the, the park, no, a description of the park is uh, one thing that's interesting because everyone know by heart the dimension. This is a 250 meters long building, 50 meters wide. 150, the distance in between here and there is 750. So, and we look this shape very free, the, the design by Niemeyer. And, uh, but actually there, it holds a very uh, clear geometry here. You no, know? and it, it what we start to explore. You no, know? there is a square that could hold the whole museum and the, the, the all the buildings inside this park, and we could like to start to propose a museum which had in, in his permanent collection the buildings by Oscar Niemeyer and the park by Burle Marx. So this is very challenging the, to, to my generation. Though we, we inherit uh, this uh, amazing uh, background, you know, that we admire and we, we follow, we like a lot, but how to deal with that in a way that allowed us to keep going. So, and this is, it's not a real project, it was just for that exhibition, but we always, I think, think in architecture in a kind of real way. This is the way that we thought about to build, one column each seven to five meters, uh, so a truss in here that would face this span, seven, uh, five meters long, uh, the floor that would be transparent most part of time. From the park, you were able to see inside the museum or inside, outside. We could control the transparency as much as we uh, would like to have it. This is a kind of tram that crossed the whole museum. Each bar is 750 meters long. The whole thing is three kilometers. This car could make the whole thing in five minutes. So it could stop in front of some works by uh, five minutes in a description, we could think about a class that uh, uh, during the night they stop like in three or four different works uh, inside that car. So the way that we present and some collages to, to show that were made by an architect called Ciro Miguel uh, that are in here. <clears throat> so, but this kind of relationship with the pre-existing park is very uh, interesting, intriguing, let's say, for us. No, I was very interested, though, so we could imagine that this could keep going inside, uh, in the middle of the trees, but we just open the floor to, to allow the trees to cross the, inside the museum, so we could place this as very, in a way, very precise because we can place this museum without suppress any tree, without change any, any way, any road. It cross a, a, a very important avenue. You are going to see uh, there is one of the entrance to Sao Paulo, so, and, and the, you see the museum, the bar crossing over this avenue here. Everyone that arrive in the city from Rio cross this avenue, so it's, it's a museum that could be showed to the streets, to the park, to the, 
we, and we don't know exactly if it is uh, a, a kind of a more architecture or more, more urban uh, scale, you know? And this is uh, a very small project to say one thing that I think that I learned from the production of the modern architecture, mostly those one in Sao Paulo. No, I mentioned Vila Nova Artigas, and I also have to mention, of course, Paulo Mendes da Rocha. Uh, but I, I, I and uh, of course, that the stuff that I'm showing is to provide some uh, images to our talking, but I, I, I feel that I'm here to honor all my professor and even those that are not here at the exhibition. No, I mean, there, there are some, but we had, uh, uh, some amazing people that are not in, in here. So it's a way to think, and a, a way to think on architecture, but it is a way to think that works associated to a capacity to do. This is uh, uh, the, 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 the challenge in about to do architecture. You have to have the tools, but we have to know what to do. Or, uh, and and, and uh, so, and this is the challenge in about the time that I started, because we were managing those two fields, no one in, in a crisis. And, and this is a, a very, very simple project. So it's uh, actually it's, uh, just a swimming pool in a neighborhood where the, 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 the code for construction has a limit in, in, in six meter high. And, and one point that I, I would mention about this project is this idea of fragment. I think that the modern architecture, mostly in Sao Paulo, was forged uh, by doing very small works, and, but those works were never just uh, com uh, comprehend in, in its own limit. No, it was always like a way to start to think in a different stuff. So, and to break, a piece of architecture into pieces, uh, to, to think on a swimming pool as a piece of a lake or a swimming pool as a piece of a sea, or uh, is uh, something that is, uh, I think that comes from this metropolitan condition where we can just infer about the whole, but it's not possible to, to, to hold the whole thing, you no? Know? And so I think that the, 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 the way that we learn is to be familiar about to, to think on, on small, very small pieces. You no, know, like this swimming pool, this swimming pool had a, a kind of uh, question, very simple. They, they bought this site to, to build a swimming pool, but the sun were almost, uh, the, sh the, the, the ground level was shaded almost the whole time. So the, this is east, that is west, six meter high with no setbacks. This one is shaded the whole morning, that one the whole afternoon. And they uh, came with an idea to have a long swimming pool, but very worried about how to have sun in it. And they asked about to displace one or other side and I, I, I said, no, it's fine, but instead to displace to one or other side, let this place it up. They asked how much, I said six meters. They asked why, and I said, because that is the surface when we think about light. And, and so what we call uh, surface, no, uh, we always think on this kind of automatism. I think it's something that I learned in my context, no? If I think about surface, I think about the ground. But the surface is, the ground is just one of the surface, no? There are many layers. If I think about the airplanes in here, you can see the old airplanes come from Rio, they cross exactly over here, it's 800 meters high. If I think about the water table in here, it's two and a half meters lower. If I think about the wires, it's six meter high. So it depends what surface we are talking about. And, and this is, uh, so it's a project that is, everything is broken into small pieces. And it actually it's a very small project, just uh, uh, it's 100 uh, square meters big. 
Well, it, it, and it uh, is like a huge pergola, allowing the, the light coming through and make this garden possible on the back, on the, uh, on the, the ground. And then one uh, last project that I would like to mention, you know, I, I'm thinking about, for instance, the, the last part of the exhibition, you know, to export, I don't know how we call it. Uh, so, but uh, this, uh, and I, I, I show this project, and I'm always think on that what we do is a kind of the, the opposite of the globalization, because it's the, the I, for sure, I was invited to, to build this project in Lugano, Switzerland, to, to act uh, not as a global architect, but to act as a, a very local one. And, well, this is, uh, 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 was a very nice and special experience to me. It's a building. If we look to the structure, you're going to see uh, that I, I'm all the time talking with my precedents. No, it's a simple structure made in concrete, for sure. And uh, here, it's like two walls as a T, and uh, in, in opposite direction to prevent uh, any horizontal movement and the, the vertical loads that rest on these columns. So this wall and two columns, this wall and two columns, and, and one single odd column in there. And uh, we, what I, I would like to mention here, no, is that is very special uh, I think to consider that uh, an invitation like that to build a building abroad, uh, it gives us an opportunity, and in this case, I think very much in this term, to make possible what wouldn't be in one context or other. So, uh, and, and one, one point here that I, I could mention, no, the ground level completely free. Of course, we look to the exhibition and we, we, we can realize that the piloty were, uh, it's an idea uh, and a name that we inherit from Le Corbusier as a name that were developed in a, a special way in Brazil. Of course, that the climatic condition in Brazil uh, made this space very special. And I, I think that we develop a kind of repertoire on it. And, and in, that's not common, let's say, in Switzerland. But uh, we are not so able to do it anymore. I mean, it's not easy to do to the social uh, problems or uh, violence, the, 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 the crazy thing about fences. And so in Switzerland, we found a place where we could do. And, we, uh, and I think they wouldn't do without our participation in this project. But, and, and we couldn't do that in Brazil at the same time. And uh, so we, we designed a lot of stuff inside. And everything is very simple, like all bathroom just made by one single layer of glass. It's a 10 millimeter thick wall. And so, in a way, very Brazilian. Uh, or oh, very with no problem. And this is what we, we did at that approach. You know? and, and it's funny because it's a building that would be forbidden many times or several, in several different ways, forbidden to be built in Brazil. No, I, I will mention. Uh, so we are not allowed to make this uh, wood panel in the facade of uh, in this uh, vertical building. We, we cannot do one single lift. We cannot make a, 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 the outside uh, staircase like we have in here, and uh, even the, the shared uh, roof garden, not, not, not possible. So that's what I brought. Thank you again. Very much. Thank you, Angela. I'm not going to introduce 
Tachan, I'll just give her a moment to get up, but we're very happy that you're going to take us far north to a different climate and some different work. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. Thank you, everybody. I'm very glad to be here as well. Um, I, I, I was thinking when Barry asked me two or three things that I learned from modernity, what I actually learned if I learned something. And, um, and it's funny because when I was, I was um, educated uh, in the School of Architecture, I was taught to forget about history completely. And I was, taught in, uh, I, was, I was starting in a moment where parametric architecture was what it, what it was the, the thing to do. And we inherited it as a, it's in a very Latin way. And we were learning these in a very Latin way as saying in a very digital, but digital with hands way, because we didn't have that much technology to, to be building parametric architecture. But that, that's what I learned. And when I started working as an architect, I totally started thinking that I should be doing that, I, that I should be discovering uncharted geometries and I should be building with these uh, parametric uh, ways of designing architecture. And I started doing that, definitely, because I wanted to be in this movement. I was in the movement where globalization was what it was uh, was happening at the moment, globalization what was starting to be uh, very, very impositive in the moment. And, um, but then uh, I, really, I really felt it was not me, it was not honest, it was not what, I, what, I, what it was me, what I, what I was raised with, et cetera. And, and I, I, I wanted to start the conversation with this image because this image, I had it a lot in, in, in my hands uh, um, in my life. I lived in, the, in Mexico City in the center, basically almost in the center. My surroundings was all Mex Me modern Mexico. And, um, and this was an image done by uh, Lola Alvarez Bravo, who's wa who was a very well-known uh, Mexican photographer. And she, she did this collage and was used for a, for a publicity of uh, Otis, the company of elevators. And so I, I've seen it many times, but I, I was never aware of it, and I was never really um, truly with it until I was realizing realizing what I wanted to do uh, as an architect. Um, I, I really like the quote of, uh, uh, that the exhibition used uh, of Octavio Paz, modernity for the last hundred years has been our style. It's been the universal style. Wanting to be modern seems like madness. We're condemned to be modern. Uh, funny also that Octavio Paz was almost one of the only intellectuals in his time that lived in a modern building. Many of them, well, Diego Rivera did, but many of the rest were living in, in the south of the city, in the more colonial places, historical places of the city, and, and Octavio Paz decided totally to live in this modern building by Pani when he returned from, from, from India. And our office is across from this building, and it's no not by chance. I truly think that for me, uh, living and understanding the history that and the legacy of modernism in our country is very important. Although I don't know if I'm, I'm, I'm totally uh, with it or against it. Um, uh, I didn't study in the uh, in the UNAM, and it was by by rebel uh, by, because I was a rebel then, and I didn't want to study where all my my family was. I'm a, I'm a family of architects. And I didn't want to study there, but I kind of studied there because my mom was a student when I was born and she took me every day there. Probably that was why I didn't study at that school because I already went at that school. So I wanted to go to something different. Um, and, and also I was very impressed when, when I, my mom was studying always since when I was very little and I had it really thought it in my mind about this uh, very volcanic landscape around it developed by Luis Barragan in Jardines del Pedregal. But I think that what truly was in my mind all the time, and probably this is why I was so rebel against it and I was so glad that when I entered architecture school I was taught about parametric architecture and not about this. It's about Latelolco. I lived really nearby, and I I I I used to 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 pass there and to live there uh, a little bit, and and this imprinted a lot of things in my mind. I was um, I was 13 when the earthquakes hit it, um, and I as I said, I lived very close by to Tlatelolco. Tlatelolco had three buildings that that fell apart. 
And I probably think that this is one of the most um, the, the most important moments in my life. I remember it. I remember as if it was yesterday. I remember each minute of those days, and I remember myself looking at these uh, buildings that fell down, and that was the most impressive thing for me. More than obviously, I was struck by the by the earthquake, by the movement. I was very little, but much more uh, than anything, I was struck at the at the idea that these buildings felt apart, that they were really down and they were really going to be gone forever. And um, it was not, as I said, until I was a practitioner and I was really a practitioner, I was like three years or four years working, that I realized how important this was in my history. And um, so I decided to move to the office to Reforma to the, to the avenue who represents the modern Mexico, modern Mexico City. And um, as you can see, Mexico, it's a very, it's a city that uh, it's um, very flat. It's two floor heights in, in, in average. And this is because of earthquakes and because we are in, a, in what it was an old lake. The old lake uh, obviously makes it very hard to build high rises, but also very expensive. So it, they only come where the financial uh, life is. So it's Reforma and, and Insurgentes, and these are where the high rises are. And we are around it. Uh, but the city is, is really has grown even out, out its limits. It limits meaning the geographic limits, because obviously urban limits or uh, planned Im limits, they're not. And housing has been a several issue since since uh, since ever since this explosion of uh, of um, of population, and there have been many solutions, uh, starting obviously from the modern solutions of Pani, uh, that were uh, solutions that obviously um, came from Le Corbusier's ideas, and uh, and there. There's a long history, which I don't have time to, 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 to talk about it in 15 minutes, obviously, but uh, about how housing developed. Right now, um, these types of units have been built like from 2000 to 2012. 33,000 units per day were built in this type of uh, typology in Mexico. That means that 14 million people started to live in these places from 2000 to today. This is not a new, a new model, unfortunately. So it's a model that we inherited since a long time. And obviously, the private developers uh, really liked it because it's a very cheap way of making a lot of houses. But the thing is that, obviously, at those days, they were uh, in the outskirts of the city. And what today is now the city. This is Santa Fe, and this is Mario Pani. And right now, today, they're in, in absolutely disconnected from every city center. And there, as I said, there are, two, there are 14 million people living there. So this is something that, for me, it's been a long time an issue. It's really strange, and this is probably why I was so fond of Pani. Pani was working in uh, uh, mostly, he was the one uh, starting to build for the government these massive social housing units. And, uh, and this is probably why I'm a, a big fan of him, uh, mostly. And uh, looking through the history, as I said, this is not new, but it has to change in Mexico. So uh, I've been very political about it. I've been trying to work out uh, with private developers to change it, but it's very difficult, and with the government. Fortunately enough, like at this moment, we are able to work with, uh, with the government. The government has someone that it's really uh, that we are able to have a dialogue with um, the Infonavit, who is the bank doing the houses, uh, has a, a very open um, and, and modern policy and contemporary policy for it, and it's understanding the problematic. Obviously, because the problem, financial problem, is getting very big. This is the reason that now they're looking at a different. Um, a uh, different model, but I'm very glad about it. So, um, as I said, I've been working with developers, trying to change things little by little. So they still obviously need to do a thousand of houses in a single unit. But I'm trying to to make them understand that it's not only about making uh, a difference of the houses because it's not uh, very nice to live in a unit with ten, twenty thousand uh, houses the same, and you become a number. So 
trying to do a little of diversity. But what I'm trying to, to make them understand is it, that it's, it's about the space, it's about the public space, and it's about the urban, the urban situation. It's about following the topography, understanding the culture, understanding the place. And we've been doing, doing so, some of these works in different places. And this is an example of a, of a place that we designed the urbanism. We were not able to design the house. But we said it doesn't matter. Um, in New York, here in, in New York, you buy an apartment of 40 square meters that it's a million dollars or more, and it's horrible, no light, uh, a lot of noise, and you still buy it. Why? Because it's New York, because you have the surroundings. So I said, okay, we'll do the urbanism. It doesn't matter because that's what really would make this place different. So we did the urbanism. We decided to follow the topography. We decided to to create with the same unit that it was given to us uh, by local architects and to place it in a way that we wanted to, to believe that it could create a neighborhood uh, where there is a concentration of activities in, the, in a center, where there is less of the activities in the surroundings and more connected to the nature when, it, when it's more of a, a part of the center. And this is how we created these, uh, this work in, in Angangueo, Michoacán. But I also think that the legacy uh, from modernism, uh, it goes in a, in a very rooted way with the materials. I think that we inherited modernism with the use of materials in a very, in, in an incredible way, I would say, you know? So uh, before going into the materials, I would just say that there are many um, efforts uh, right now uh, in contemporary architecture that are doing these uh, ideas of trying to work with different uh, um, developers and pushing them to, to create new houses with a different quality. We ourselves are doing and developing a house that um, it will cost uh, between $5,000 and $8,000 in total, depending depending the place, uh, your your status, etc., cetera, and, uh, and the conditions, your, 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 your weather conditions, et cetera. But um, uh, the main thing with this project is that we, we wanted to create a, a single unit that it's able to, to multiply in many ways, but also to respond to different cultures. The most uh, important problem, problem that I see with these units that they create, there are many, obviously, as you can imagine when I show the image, is that they don't respond at all to the weather, to the, to the conditions of the place, to the culture of the people. And this is, a, I'm not going to go into detail, but it's a modular solution that could allow many ways of, uh, of, of, of inhabiting. Especially, it can hold a, a kitchen that goes outside, a kitchen that is more a traditional kitchen, like in Chiapas, but it could allow a, a modern, more modern or contemporary kitchen that goes in, inside the house, uh, in, like in, in, in suburban Mexico is used or the same with the toilets, or with the same with the, with the exterior and interior spaces in, the, in, in, in trying to think on the weather. Um, but as I said, I think materials is something that, um, uh, for me, it's also a big thing in, in my architecture. And, and how it, we inherited uh, the modern architecture uh, in many different ways. Obviously, we have like these very impressive uh, 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 responses like this uh, Edificio J. Sur of Augusto Al uh, Alvarez, but also like the translation and the use of this material that are important techniques and important materials, like the library of Alberto Calach in, in, in Mexico, or the Cineteca Nacional uh, of Michel Rothkin, or the, the Sumaya Museum from Fernando Romero. But I also think that the translation of it and the, and the legacy the, that absorbed the culture, the real the movement that really absorbed the culture, as Juan O'Gorman did with the uh, beautiful um, uh, library, central library of the UNAM, or uh, the Secretaría de Transportes that no, unfortunately no, no longer exists that way, uh, or fel the structures of Felix Candela, that they are taking the advantage of the, of the labor, the hand labor that we have in Mexico and the, the, the weather conditions. Uh, the Anahuacali by Diego Rivero, Juan O'Gorman, and the translation of it to, uh, uh, to, uh, to a contemporary architecture that can, can exist and can be possible. Uh, an architect that truly makes it 
uh, in an impressive way is Mauricio Rocha, that it has been developing this sense of working with the materiality, the materiality that we have and the hand labor. This is the Campamento de Edificios Públicos. But uh, I think it was also something that happened before. This is the, the, the pavilion in, in the Bruselas World Fair done by Pe Pedro uh, Ramirez Vázquez. Um, and for example, the, the La Tallera by Frida Escobedo in, uh, in Cuernavaca. No? The use of the, the very economic and, and everyday use materials in these public buildings that also it could be something that reflects how we absorb the modernity. Um, this is a, 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 a shelter done by Luis Aldrete in the pilgrimage routes by brick, or different kind of screens used uh, as, uh, as, as these ones in many ways. You, materials that had been there forever and used in a very contemporary way. Again, Mauricio Rocha with the School of uh, Plastic Art, of Arts in Oaxaca that we very much learned from and we took. And probably I'm taking the references that I have because they're my contemporaries and then uh, we use them a lot. And we learned from Mauricio Rocha and we did this house in, in Ajijic done from Compact to Earth, uh, with trying to basically respond to the client's needs. And I think that this is something that I probably uh, rebelled uh, and, and went against uh, modernism, because I think that uh, for me, architecture is a built thing. Architecture is a space. Architecture is not a drawing. And in this case, the, the client had um, only uh, 100,000 US dollars to build a house. And she wanted a house, a big house, like around 3,000 square feet. And when she arrived with the, with the program and the, and the budget, uh, we thought in the beginning, this is going to be impossible. She doubles the, bu uh, the, the budget or she decreases in half the program. And, and then I decided to go with the challenge and try to find a material that would allow us really to fulfill her, her willings. Because as I said, if not, he was, he was going to go away saying, well, I don't have a, a more money and I really want this house. I want this house built. So I'm just, I, probably she would have just built it and we would not be able to do architecture. So we decided to fulfill her needs and go with it. And therefore we, we decided to use compacted earth. It's not only a thing about uh, giving the solution for the problem, but also about being very honest with, with what we do. No? I believe that the use of materials in my case is about, it's about everything. It's about uh, allowing us to build, but it's about also allowing us to be honest, to be, to be what we are. And this is when I, again, go back to relating to modernity, because, and as a spat said, pass, Octavio Paz again said, the look for modernity uh, took us to, to, to uncover our antiquity or our past. And, uh, and for me, the look for modernity took me to, to discover the way I wanted to do architecture, that it was a, an architecture that I think it's honest and it needs, to be, um, it needs to be contemporary, it needs to be propositive, it needs to be aesthetic, but it needs to be honest. And, and I think the use of materials helps a lot with that. We did a funeral house in, uh, in San Luis Potosí. And uh, in this case, we knew that we, had, um, we were going to have a very um, not trained hand labor. So we decided to develop the project while, uh, while working with the, with the people that were going to build it to understand how they were going to build it and how, what were their skills. So. Um, uh, I'm not going to um, stop focusing on these temporary pavilions like the one from Frida Escobelo in El Museo del Eco, or Pedro y Juana in Archivo de Diseño, or MMX in El Eco, but I guess that the images speak from themselves about the materials, Productora in Zócalo, or we also did this pavilion that uh, um, instead of thinking that this is, could look like scaffolding because it wasn't, it was the idea of creating something that it would respond to the amount of money that the project had, the amount of time that we had, and, the, and the, really the willings we wanted to do and, and create with this thing. So I also think that the, the legacy um, uh, and, the, uh, and the, um, the things that we learned from it, it was to adapt to our reality. Uh, or probably the rebeldity to, to it, to modernism. 
we imported uh, a lot of models and we did them in an incredible way. No, Pedro Ramirez Vasquez with the with the Museum of um, uh, Anthropology Museum, or we also translate these uh, these things into experimentations. No, a museum in Mexico was not part of the culture. This is something that came with modernism. With modernism, it came the museum idea, the, the whole thing. Uh, Matthias Geritz it tried to create a different space of experimentation, but I also think that that is something that I, I was reveling against, in, especially, for example, in this project in the Jardín Botánico, where we created a place that it became it becomes a museum, but it's not a museum. And it's a, it's a place where art is displayed. This is a piece from Anola, Alora and Calzadilla, American art, artist, very important American artist, or Francis Alice. But uh, art, or, or La Fure Eliasson, that art becomes everyday life in this, pre, in this place. And I think that this is a Dan Graham Pavilion, and I think that this is something very important. I think that we can import a lot of models, but I think we have to uh, really think on the, on the place that, we look at, that we're working at. Uh, in this place in Culiacani, we would have, with the same budget, the same exact pieces, which would become an incredible museum, we could become an incredible museum. Uh, we have pieces from the best art, contemporary artists. We have a lot of money for, for the project. But if we would have built a white box and put all the pieces there, nobody would have visited. Why? Because the culture is not about museums. And this is something that I think we also uh, translate into it. So I learned uh, two or three things, and I, do, and I did, and I used them as references. And I'm just going to go very quick at it, at it, because I don't have any more time. And, um, but you can truly see that I also learned some things from it. This is um, my, uh, a work that we did in a pilgrimage route that obviously is absolutely in honor and reference to Matthias Gary's The Torres de Satellite. And with this, I will end up my presentation. Thank you, and I leave you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Barry. Thank you, Fabrizio, Stan, Sarah, and everybody involved in this uh, event. Uh, it is a pleasure for me to stay here with you, here with you today. Uh, first of all, I would like to explain a couple of things about this brief presentation. I, I think this is important. I'm not an expert in this topic. I'm not an expert in Latin American architecture. I'm not an expert in Colombian architecture or, or this period of time. I will only talk about uh, one architect, Rogelio Salmona, and about one of his projects, Las Torres del Parque, the Park Towers. Their influence in our work is not uh, direct or obvious, but this architecture is something that in Colombia you can feel in the air. It is much more like something you can breathe naturally, and particularly so in Bogota. I'm not from Bogota. Uh, let's see. Colombia is located uh, within the tropical belt, uh, and it is crossed from south to north by the Andes Mountains. And because of that, there, is, there are no seasons, and ecosystems are defined depending on the altitude above sea level. And that is really, really important in, in Colombia, because we have the, the, the Andan Cordillera here. Uh, Bogota is located here, Medellin here, and this is Cartagena, for example. Cartagena, located close to the sea, has a constant uh, summer weather. Medellin located a mile above sea level has a constant spring weather, and Bogota, located at a height of uh, 1.6 miles above sea level, has a constant uh, mild winter weather. I, I'm from Medellin, but I lived in Bogota for three years in a neighborhood called La Macarena, which is the place where, the, where Las Torres del Parque uh, are located. Uh, and this is why I want to talk about, about it. Because I know I know it as a conventional city, and not only as an architect. And this this point is really uh, a key point for me, 
to talk about architecture and not always in the in this academic aspects. Our work is based on the concept of permeability, and that is why I will talk about Salmona's project using that concept. I hope that the use of this strategy allows you to see some connections and distances with this outstanding architecture. In this case, and trying to be more precise, I will separate the concept of permeability in five aspects. Urban, architectural, environmental, material, and social permeability. In each one of them, I am going to show you uh, Las Torres del Parque in a concrete relationship with one of our, uh, one of our projects. Permeability is a quality that allows interchange, transfer, and gradation. Something is permeable when it can be influenced or intervened. It can be porous or an absorbent or even establish astonishing interactions with its environment. Permeable or open architecture has a wide range of adaptability and transformation. On one which by its geometric geometric and spatial order accepts transformation in time and tight and crossed interactions with the weather and the people. Very different architectures contain diverse expression of permeability, especially those of intertropical regions where moderate and constant climatic conditions enable them to build their most intense physical expression. So the first point is, is urban permeability. Salmona started this project with two big and rectangular towers, but then he proposed three volumes. And only the central uh, one is what we normally understand as a tower, as a vertical uh, building. The north and south volumes are a strange combination of vertical, curved, horizontal, tilted, and staggered directions. You can see it here. This is the central building, this is the north building, and this is the south building. Creating the buildings, Salmona is simultaneously shaping the public space, avoiding the typical fences, promoting the circulation of people, and the use of the public level. Still today, you can go to the public level of the towers and find a coffee shop. You can have a scrambled eggs or a typical food like changua which is a soup. Uh, you can find a barber shop, a small supermarket, different kind of uh, offices, and small kindergarten. You can really find public space availability and a subtle connection with La Macarena uh, neighborhood and with the mountains. Saying this in, in a city like this, like you know, New York, where you have everything, where you can always walk, it sounds really, I don't know, maybe silly or I don't know, but uh, we that live in these South American cities understands really what it, that this is a huge effort in a project. So this is the ur these are the urban aspects of this fantastic architecture. This and that's the situation. Of course, the, the land belongs to the to the owners. But it's the opposite, the opposite situation when you, when you avoid the use of fences, because what this is saying is, is private property, but I don't know, clarifying that this is a public space, really, that everybody is going, going to use. So. This uh, sports scenaries or coliseums is uh, a project that is understood as a single building or container that is perforated or penetrable in different ways by people, weather, and vegetation. We propose it to blend a semi-covered public space with sport areas and gardens using the same technical and special strategies. The geometric system of the roof, of the roof formed by parallel strips is aligned with the sun path in order to control the sunlight. These parallel bars, which act as a technical, spatial, and bioclimatic pattern, can be extended in the east-west direction, repeated or added in the north-south direction, and are susceptible of 
uh, varying in height in order to produce shade uh, in the perimeter and keep the height required for the each spot in the inside. This is Medellin. This is the valley of Abura where Medellin is located. Uh, this is the flat zone. We have a, a long and narrow valley, uh, and we have a st steep, steep uh, slopes. Uh, but this is located in the central zone, the, the democratic uh, zone of the city, really. So we have this, so these four uh, buildings. Uh, no mechanical air condition condition conditioning is needed in high energy consumption is avoided. The porous enclosures allow seeing the activities taking place on the inside blending the outer public life and the recreation and sport activities. The shapes are connected with the near sport building, soccer stadium, and with the hills of Medellin. So this is about urban permeability, about you don't, you don't have to pay the ticket to see the games, for example. The second point will be architectural permeability. So, to define this project, Salmona uses open, unfinished, and complementary geometries. He builds curved edges by rotating straight lines. The tower looks like big fragments of something unfinished that could grow or decrease, something that is completely by use, by the weather, and the daily life of La Macarena neighborhood. Each one of the different types of apartments can be understood as a three-dimensional module or as a housing pattern that is repeated, rotated, or added to, find, to define the building as a fragment, as a big fragment. The tectonic and spatial qualities, terraces, balconies, corridors, windows, and gardens designed for the apartments determine the general expression of the building. And perhaps while Salmona was designing these models, the towers, the towers were emerging. These are the different typologies. All of them uses two floors. This is, these are really small apartments. So you can see the local, the, I don't know, the, to understand the, 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 this apartment as a, almost as a big brick also. And this is the project of the, Orchidora, the Orchidorama, located also in the same zone that the sports scenarios. You can see the sports scenarios, sorry. Here. This is the location. This is the, uh, the two hills inside the valley, Del Volador and Aburra. So this is the Orchidorama, located inside the Botanical Garden of <coughs> Medellin. The, or the Orchidorama is based on a hexagonal module, while the plan allows flexibility by adding hexagons where needed in elevation. Each metal tree is articulated with the scale of the surrounding trees and relates to their strategies. It concentrates the technical installations net network in the trunk, uses the structure base for the growth of gardens or understory plants, uh, and defines a translucent canopy at the same height as the surrounding foliage. Uh, the flexible perimeter geometry allows the Orchidorama to comfortably adjust to the void left by the previous pavilion in the forest and restore the tissue. Each module of seven hexagons constitutes the special and bioclimatic pattern that allows repetition or daily growth over time and adaptation to budget. Okay, environmental, environmental permeability. These towers act like curved and continuous perimeters with two kinds of surfaces. Exterior, exterior convex and in, interior concave, at least in two cases because the central tower is, is a little bit different. Salmona has located the social uh, areas of each apartment towards the convex exterior and the services areas, cor corridors, and some bedrooms towards the concave interior. On one hand, he favors the observation of the urban landscape 
and on the other, he promotes the use of a quiet and open patio. From a bioclimatic, bioclimatic point of view, the exterior facades receive the morning sun and the interior facade receive the afternoon sun. The thin thickness of the buildings promote constant cross ventilation. From the outside, these towers are affected by the irregular height of the mountains in Bogota. From the inside, they are affected by the circular patio of the bull ring. This is a, the Macarena neighborhood. Uh, and this is like the towers are connected really with the shapes of the blocks. And when you walk, you can feel it. And these are the, the inner pat patios. Uh, this is the San Vicente Ferrer Community uh, Center. The name in Spanish is something like a educational park, a parque educativo. This is a project that Fajardo is doing, the politician, uh, Sergio Fajardo, is, is, is building right now. And in this case, it is not about to build uh, some libraries, libraries uh, in the middle of, of uh, neighborhoods with low incomes, but uh, now he's the governor of Antioquia, uh, where, where Medellin is the capital, so it's really the state of Antioquia. For us, will be the department. And what he is doing now is, at least for me, is even more interesting. He's trying to build 80 uh, educational parks in little towns uh, located in different zones of the, of the state. So this, this project is one of them. This project aims to complete the shape of a hill that has been affected by different kinds of topographic actions. An irregular edge uh, of two arms contains a patio which stands and allow to locate the classroom following the external outline. In this case, the roof is a big terrace and a new public space connected to a distant church and downtown. From a bioclimatic point, uh, point of view, the exterior facade receive the morning sun and the interior facades receive the afternoon sun. Uh, it's just the same location that has the towers. The thickness of the buildings promotes constant cross ventilation and the patio is protected from the cold air currents. From the outside, this building is affected by uh, the material diversity of the San Vicente urban structure. And from the inside, it is affected by the topographic accidents. So these are, these are the, the two arms. This is the connection with the, the town. These are not projects with a lot of money. We have really, really uh, precise budgets. This, and this is the typical classroom. Okay, the, the fourth point will be material permeability. From a current perspective, it's good to mention some implications that the use of brick may have. Landscape transformation inquiries, CO2 emissions during the manufacturing process, and constructive activity with pollu polluting byproducts. But in the case of the towers, the advantages, the advantages were obvious to Salmona. Close and high quality clays, reasonable costs, and a material with good thermal condition. In this case, the material election is even more obvious because Salmona knows the skills of the artisans. Actually, in this project, there is a mix of craft and a mechanical uh, technologies trying to do a lot with restricted resources and trying to push the boundaries of the material use. Exploring its extensive possibilities of permeability or impermeability. Uh, the concept of permeability really is the, con the complete concept. We are trying to work with that, and it's something that we can understand as a, I, I don't know, like a gradient that moves from the permeability until the completely impermeability. But you can find a lot of different uh, positions on the line. This is a school designed uh, in Cartagena with a really, really hot weather, always is summer, and it is a little bit dry. Mm, this is the Flor del Campo School. And again, from a current perspective, it seems appropriate to mention some uh, implications that the use of precast concrete may have. 
landscape pollution again and transformation inquiries, CO2 emissions again, and I don't know, the manufacturing process and constructive activity with polluting byproducts. In this case, the advantages were obvious to us. Close and high quality cement uh, or raw material, sand and aggregates, reasonable costs, and a material with high durability, which is easily penetrable to leave great amount of air passing through. With the local precast technologies, we try to solve the main aspects of the project. Space fragmentation in five yards, facade and enclosures, uh, and a natural cross ventilation. And the, the last point will be social permeability. This is really a beautiful stencil that you can find in Bogota everywhere. And it's, it's the North Tower. Uh, at least for me, it's not normal or typical that the stencil, this is not the topic of an stencil, and in Bogota it's happening, uh, I don't know why. I don't know why, but this is really interesting for me, thinking about social permeability. This project coincides uh, with some of the current sus sustainable urban policies. High quality social housing, city densification, control of the urban expansion, diverse types of small housing and mixed uses, and a diverse population. This is not a project for a social elite. It is, a, it is compact, diverse, and has a fantastic central location in Bogota. These were the conditions that Salmona faced and in strengthening through this unique building the, the day life of, of La Macarena neighborhood. So this is uh, the apartment number located at the 26th floor uh, of the central tower. These are some friends who lived there uh, like five years ago. So this is the typical aspect of the interior. What, what can you do? The, the floors with, uh, in wood, the, I don't know. They are really good apartments and are working really, really in a good way. And to finish, uh, this is the Santo Domingo Kindergarten located. The, the Masanti's uh, Biblioteca will be behind this little mountain. So you need to take the metro line and then take the cable line uh, to, to go to the library, but this is located even behind that. And this is what is happening. The city is still growing. There's a lot of people coming from the, from the I don't know, we still have a war. So that's what happened that happen when you have a war. So the Santo Domingo neighborhood is formed by self-constructed constructed house made of reddish brick and flat concrete roof slabs that allow an irregular vertical growth over time. Little by little, this construction growing in height and change the reddish aspect for colored paints and plasters that the dwellers enjoy and regard as very quality construction. Because of this, we wanted to project the, the project to show its levels, staggered sections, and its diversity and geometric uh, irregularity, as well as it finishes in granite plaster in blue and green, with the intention that the new public facility could be easily recognized, and at the same time, irre irregularly, ir irregularly articulated with the neighborhood's organic life. This building is a meeting place for a community that lacks common or public space. Uh, it looks like a simple action, but the, behind this kind of project, there's a huge political action, the creation of groups uh, with social workers, with uh, urbanism, uh, urbanist people, I don't know, with, with designers, with uh, anthropologists working with the municipality, deciding where to locate one of these buildings. So what is a social architecture? All architecture is really social. So, but it is different when you can have, when you can work with a group of diverse persons and talk with the leaders of the community and try to see what is uh, relevant for those kind of, of communities. 
So uh, I hope to continue this conversation at the round table. Thank you. I think that we are already a little bit uh, beyond schedule, so we, again, we'll try to accelerate. Well, thank you very much for your free, fantastic presentation. I think that uh, can generate multiple questions, debates, and themes. So the idea is to, for me to stimulate the further curiosities that I have, and I think I might share with the audience to then pass the mic to, uh, to the audience for further questions. So, for some reason, like I think that it's interesting in, in your presentation how it, it seems to continue a discourse that the exhibition uh, opens in a very optimistic way, no? Because if we would have uh, had this exhibition four to five years ago, probably we would be in a kind of nostalgic mode of uh, remembering a kind of political role of architects in, in the period that the exhibition covers to then see a lack of kind of like engagement um, in Latin America and, and elsewhere. Well, it seems that there are multiple symptoms, the one that you showed in your work, but also other ones that are mapped by some of the authors that are even here tonight, that seem to relaunch a new political role for the architects. Of course, the state has changed, the kind of stakeholders uh, are different than the ones that, that were mapped in the exhibition, but no, there are actions, there are uh, intentions, there are practices that the three of you uh, represent very well tonight about a, a new, kind of role emerging in the region, uh, and that's why I think that the exhibition in Latin America in general are very interesting to us today, about a new uh, position that the architect is seeking for herself or himself in a kind of political discourse. And what do you think about that? Do you, do you see kind of commonalities within the region or more local specificity? Of course, Medellin has been quite often evoked as a, as a kind of like case study of the, this new dialogue between architecture and politics, but there are multiple actions that seem to be occurring, and I wanted to have your, your comment on that. How, how do you see the political role being renewed after a certain stagnation? And, and again, I think being in this moment, the neoliberalist uh, discourse that seems to be overwhelming just a few years ago starts to show its cracks, of course. Uh, and there are new governments in place, there are new questioning about the model, the model of the 2008 crisis that started actually here in New York. Uh, as, as proved that that model is not suitable anymore, and that has consequences on architecture. So. Well, I could even say that in Mexico, for me, at some point after after this period uh, in postmodernism, architecture uh, left its political part. I mean, it's a it's a very strong statement to say, but I do think that uh, architecture completely. Uh, uh, fell apart because many. One of the reasons was because uh, the, w the economy was so weak that obviously this was not possible. The architecture was not possible to emerge. But then, when we, when, when the economy started to be more stable, architecture started to to again flourish, but in a very less political way, uh, doing a lot of private works, etc. Because architecture and politics were completely dis uh, disconnected. And, um, and I feel now that in, in this moment, actually, the uh, uh, contrary is happening. Like the generation of architects that is working now in Mexico is be starting to become very political about it. And it's starting to be, the architecture is starting to be political again, which it is. <coughs> architecture is about politics, I think. And, um, and I'm glad about it because, because it needs to, no? Because architecture is to build a better, a better place, no? Or this is what I wish for. And, um, and, and, and this moment of disconnection 
or, uh, suddenly all the public works or the, all the housing that was produced was being produced by developers, by financial institutions, by, by politicians, by architects, but, but, but architects that were not very well trained. And, and, and all of a sudden we have this now legacy of a, of a city that it's, or, or a country that it's built mainly by auto construction and by architecture that is not related basically to architects, no? Or uh, in, a, in a general, very general way of seeing, saying it. But I'm, 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 I'm very happy that right now, like the discussion, it's again back in the table. For, as I said, as you mentioned, the crack of the ne neoliberalism and mainly because of financial reasons. But then now we are allowed to become, to start becoming again part of the discussion in the political realm, so. Uh, in Medellin, we have a special condition because, I don't know, we have like three periods uh, with a major uh, who had a, an architect father and a family of architects and he really knows the situation. Uh, he's open to to think about the, I don't know, the urban transformations and uh, involve architects uh, in the government. Uh, so. That's, that's, that's the, really the reason behind what happened in Medellin. Uh, and saying that, Medellin is, doesn't have anything special, really. Medellin is only, uh, I don't know, uh, evolving to be a, seat, a conventional South American city and living behind that uh, situation because the 80s in, in Medellin, uh, what I lived when I was a teenager, it was a war a drugs, uh, the Pablo Escobar against the municipality, uh, and bombs everywhere. And we live in our, our apartments. Uh, my father, uh, I don't know, you just, we're in a really restricted social situation. And, and I'm feeling, feeling fear. So what happened in Colombia is, it's related also with the, with, with the, conception that we have as a society right now with, 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 with drugs, with, with the traffic of illegal drugs. Uh, because that's the main topic in Colombia. That's, if we understand the problem of drugs as a, as a global problem and not, uh, I don't know, saying the, the, the problem is Colombia, all the people in Colombia is bad people, or the Mexican now, is, uh, the problem is Mexican, no, the problem is, the problem is com a complete chain is a consumption, a laundry money, it, it's, it's the crops, of course, it's everything. And behind that, uh, the 80s, for example, in Medellin, is like, a, I don't know, like a, talking about architecture, it's a difficult moment. Uh, nobody do anything, and what, if you wanted to do something, you had to design in a neoclassical neo way for an, for a, Narco guy. <laughs> that's that's the reality of the of, of things. So what's happening now? It's a new situation. Mm -hmm. uh, this traffic, it's I don't know, not as strong as as before. Uh, and the globe, I don't know, the Obama, because everything here is about the U.S. U.S. is always saying what to do and what not to do, and what is good and what is not good. Sorry, but that's the real world. So Obama has a, I don't know, a vision of the problem that I found really, really uh, correct or precise. It, it is a, everything is connected. We, we need to work this as a group of countries. So what can we do? Uh, do we legalize? Do we, what can we do? Because it, it is a really huge problem. And in Colombia, the war finally disappears when, when, when the, the drugs would be legalized. That's that's and that that's all. That's all. And but Philip, somehow you say that it's interesting that you mentioned this idea that neo-colonial was the style. But now it seems that there is a kind of association, and I think in, in, in throughout all the countries about a kind of idea of future associated with a modern language. So in a way, modern architecture. So there is a kind of jump back from the exhibition to now, where the references became again this mo moment of modern architecture as a kind of 
a driver for progress. So whereas we can say that in Europe, modern architecture was a consequence of industrialization uh, in Latin America, actually it has been almost the opposite. So modern architecture has been a driver for transformation and industrialization. So and we, I have the, the sensation that now we're back again where there is a kind of association between our linguistic choices and an idea of progress. So your mention of permeability, kind of uh, symbolism somehow of a change that is occurring. Do you agree with, with this reading that there is a kind of more consensual interest in a certain idea of architecture embracing certain sets of values? I think that in Colombia, at least, there is really a local discussion about if, if, if the, this period with Salmona is the only architecture that is possible to do. But that is really an academic, <laughs> uh, really, really yeah. closed uh, discussion. But what's happening really is that we have a lot of architecture, a diverse and a architecture, and a architecture decided not by, designed not by architects, by people really, that it's, from my point of view, very in interesting still, because they use a lot of uh, bioclimatic strategies, because they have a lot of restrictions with materials, so they do what, what, what they can, and, and so the influences to our, our generation are a mix of influences. Of course, we have, for example, imagine we had a period of time uh, uh, between the 30s and 50s with a spectacular modern architecture in, the, in downtown. Uh, concrete and stone, not brick, because the clays in Medellin are not good. So, uh, But our generation is also influenced by the architecture without architects, I think. So. I think, uh, unfortunately, in our in our country, the the future of of like the the, the vision and the the, fu the vision of the of of, of the future and the, of the, the the dream is the American dream, and it's very rooted and it's very. Uh, so we want to like so as a society, we're looking forward to be to be an American family with a suburban house, and this is why probably the legacy of the social housing is what we have, no? So, but obviously in, a, in a more academic way, yeah, the discussion is more about uh, uh, looking the modernity as a future, but I think that it's only in an academic level, no? I think more in, in, the, in the society is more about the American dream and the suburban house and still the neoclassic uh, idea of living, no? And Angelo, would you, would you say that, see that also in Brazil? Oh, uh, uh, no, but Tatiana mentioned uh, Otávio Paz. So <coughs> uh, Otávio Paz also said, no, that uh, what uh, put all of us together is our common f future or shared future. So this is, <coughs> if you think about, the, and this is quite modern, no, to to have the future guiding our action nowadays. So and this is, uh, I think that we never had a moment where the future is driving our present more than nowadays because our understanding, for instance, <coughs> about the environment. So uh, if you don't change our way to act, it, so you're about to lose everything. So how much the the, the, the source of water can resist, how much the planet itself can resist. So, and, and then I think that we are now in the most uh, modern condition that we ever had. Uh, but uh, and in this way, I think that both things are, are totally linked. No, but the, the, I, I mean modern as a condition uh, to be living at this time. Not modern as uh, exactly at the piece of architecture we have at the exhibition. Uh, so, and, and what I, I think that architecture uh, linked to the policy in, in, in the best way that we could is uh, um, the, 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 what we call the, the word as, as, as built. Architecture belongs to this. There is no 
way to the, if we if you are a serious intellectual and you think about the, the the way that we could live, how you can put all those ideas in in, in into a reality. So this is what we call architecture, I think. And and sometimes uh, in 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 our context, I think. No, we, we could experience you know, how much important is architecture also linked to an institution. So if uh, when I, I, I think or I experience that you know, uh, at our architecture school, and if I, I, I think about the hard political time we had after, uh, right after the inauguration of that building, you know, that put away the, the, the men that had designed the school, that had found that school. Uh, and uh, also with him were expelled like uh, Paulo Mendes da Rocha, or only Pritzker Prize of that school. Uh, so I, I think that in a time where people were being silent, the building kept talking. So I, I think that architecture allowed us to to do a work that so fulfill of humanity that realized it, it, that can make this kind of thing possible. So of course that it had been had to be associated to politics. There is no no sense to 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 to, to consider that we are going to keep building the world in a very fast with no time. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, like if uh, we don't care about what we are going to be built. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting that you mentioned Artigas, no? Because uh, some interpretation of the decision to go with concrete were really about concrete as a, as a tool of pedagogy, in a certain way, a certain idea of austerity, even to educate the middle class in Brazil, uh, for s according to certain authors, and also to to provide kind of like technological capacity to the worker. So, in your presentation, you quite often evoke the notion of materials, no? uh, very important in your practice, and and also in, in your practice, the question of pragmatism and reality uh, happens quite often. So, there is a, of course an utopian component, but then it seems always to have to be measured to the feasibility, the budget, the client, the urban conditions. So, how would you comment that? In a way, a recurrent question of really making then ideas really land uh, in a realistic uh, execution. So the, the the aspect of the built architecture is very important in your practice. No, so comp if if compared to other to other contexts, you mean the concrete as material, reinforced concrete. Well, th that that was somehow the discourse. No, back in the in the sixties. No, concrete oh, yeah. as, a, as a political material in a certain way. Yeah, but I. Well, I, uh, what I, I could say that I learned from the previous generation, oh, you have to know where you are going to put your coins. I mean, where you, 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 you what uh, allow or what deserve uh, your time, your money when you are building a building. So, and, and to, to, to put uh, your attention, your time, your money, on the structure, to make this a structure that is something that appears even before the building exists and that will remain much after the building uh, being uh, like ruined. So I, I think it makes sense though to not uh, rely too much on, on something that is very ephemeral. So, and uh, this I think that was a good choice if the, it's not concrete itself, but to, uh, it's part of understanding architecture. You no, know, if you look the word architecture, and in, in, on philosophy, it, it describes the capacity to put uh, on the word a, a proper hierarchy. So uh, to to be able to uh, understand what is more important, less important, to follow this chain. I think that is is like crucial. So would there be, I think it's a moment to pass the microphone to our audience. So I think there are microphones around the... Easily continue the conversation. I'm sorry to frustrate you if you have questions, maybe. 
Um, I'd like to invite the participants to meet us at the back of the auditorium if you want to ask a question or two individually on the way out to the architects in the, in the vestibule. But I was told the, show, the other show starts at 8. I want to thank the three architects for giving us such a stimulating view. and Fabrizio for starting the conversation, which we will continue tomorrow at Princeton. Thank you very much. <laughs>